It's very difficult for any motor racing team to stay at the top forever. But one team that's been consistent in being always in contention has been the Williams Grand Prix team. I had the opportunity of driving the Williams Renault at the Paul Ricard circuit during a test session. And it was for me a very enlightening experience. Free engineering is a name that's synonymous with success. Frank Williams, a constructor, has won the world championship many different times. As a man, he's immaculate in his preparation. His team, probably the best engineered team in Grand Prix racing today. For the beginning of the 1989 season, I was able to drive, almost before anyone else, the FW12C. This is the car with the Renault V10 engine. And at that time, only Terry Butson and Ricardo Patrese had ever driven the car. So it was indeed almost an honor to be able to go to the Paul Ricard circuit in the south of France to get into this amazing machine. First of all, Renault Racing have a very impressive facility there. No standing out in the cold for the Williams Renault people. They have a building exclusively for their use, so that no journalists or no spying photographers can see what's going on. The cars are wheeled in to this big building where the transporter already sits, and all of the telemetry that's necessary in Grand Prix racing today is housed. There were 19 Renault engineers I counted on that day with their grey overalls on, looking after the electronics and the engine of this new beast. car itself, very impressive to drive. First of all, impressive because for once in a modern Grand Prix car, there was space for the driver. Lots of space all the way around them. The steering wheel was in the right place. The rev counter could be seen easily. The other instruments immediately recognizable. The gear shift, get atable. The seat itself, so, very comfortable. Have to spring to Why? The second, I don't have to. Probably because Patrick Head, the designer, is someone who's interested in human mechanics, human engineering, and understands that to drive a car, like any man doing his work, you have to be comfortable. The other point is that experienced Grand Prix drivers have been driving for Williams for a good many years. People like Nelson Piquet and Alan Jones, very demanding drivers. Nigel Mansell drove for that team, as did Keke Rosberg. Terry Butson is a man of experience today, and the most experienced Grand Prix driver today is Ricardo Patrese. All of those drivers know what they want and demand what they need. And it was obvious in this car. The car was impressive also in the sense that the engine was so smooth and so flexible. I expected it just not to have the torque that the car enjoyed. The Paul Ricard racetrack for me was an impressive one to go back to because I knew it all. I knew the racetrack from years gone by. But what utterly amazed me about the, the Williams Grand Prix car, above any other that I had driven so far, was the composite carbon fiber brakes. Because it was a circuit that I felt comfortable with and a circuit with a good su surface, I could get in deep under braking. And for the first corner after the pits, arriving at high speed and putting those fully warmed up carbon fiber brakes on, it was as if somebody had put a parachute out behind me. The car was suddenly arrested, and in fact, I stopped much too early for the corner. At one point, I had to accelerate to get to the corner after braking. Now that, to me, 
was the single most important element of development or improvement that I saw in any of the cars that I drove during these tests, the brakes. The aerodynamics of the car were also impressive. The car was better at high speed. Slow speed corners it suffered from understeer. But the car was generally neutral in its handling behavior. The only corner that I really didn't go around quickly was seen. The one at the end of the straight at the poly pad circuit. I think to go around that quickly, Jackie Stewart had to be 20 years younger, at least. And even then, it would have been a question of holding my breath. But as far as I was concerned, it was the most satisfying test that I had done, simply because I was in a position to drive the car in a comfortable fashion, have an engine that responded properly, and have a team that I felt were indeed impressive. So I think the combination of Williams and Renault will be something that will be enjoyed for a good few more years to come. To drive a championship winning car is always a pleasure. I had the opportunity of driving Renault's four-wheel drive turbocharged 1988 touring car championship car. It won the championship of France. It was a thrill. It was a difficult car to drive but amusing to drive. It was nice to get out of a single seater for a change and get into a car that had rollover bars and enough space in it to breathe properly. And it certainly was thrilling and amusing. and certainly enjoyable cars I was to be able to test in this series was the 1988 Renault 21 Turbo. It was this car that won the 88 French Touring Car Championship. It was very fast, it was very agile, but it was to some extent like turning the clock back. I remember when I used to drive touring cars way back in the early 60s, in the mid-60s. In a funny sort of way, touring car racing, although clearly it's become much faster and more technical, has not changed a lot. The inside of the car felt that I had come back to an age gone by. The switches, the way the dashboard and the instrument panel was laid out, looked like a little bit yesteryear. It just was a bit old-fashioned. in which the car drove itself was not as a high-tech field as I would have expected. The car clearly was very fast and very competitive. The car did slide quite a lot. It had oversteer and it had understeer. The turbo lag was there and took time for the driver to interpret. And turbocharged driving was something of a speciality. You can't abuse the turbocharge too much or you have too much wheel spin, too much power, and your tire temperatures go up too quickly. So there is a delicacy of driving when you drive a turbocharged touring car with all of that weight that you have to take into consideration. You're not allowed to throw the car around from one side to the other. If you do that, the tires will certainly no longer perform over a number of laps in the fashion that you would want it. The combination of the harder tyres on the left-hand side and the uh, softer tyres on the right-hand side weren't very sympathetic to the car. But I myself made several mistakes, that's why I kept going round. Rather than trying to do a fast lap after a mistake, I wanted to do a lap yeah, sure. and get rid of it and then try. But the balance between left and right corners was not the same, yeah. so it was a little difficult to interpret. The brakes, they were good, no troubles. The transmission seemed smooth and not too rough, although it certainly didn't have the touch of a Formula One racing transmission. The 
car was noisy inside because, of course, no baffling and that enormous amount of turbocharged sound being thrown from one bare wall to the other, a noisy experience. the car was in fact a great challenge. I was travelling on the track for that very first time. So therefore this was for me quite a business of learning the racetrack. I drove the car in total I think 38 laps which gave me as good an indication about the motor car as I would expect. I got down to competitive times. There had been a race the day before and we were around the same time if not a little faster than the cars that were racing in the year 1989, with less power than the car that I was driving. It would have taken me a few more laps to get towards what would have been necessary for a lap record time, but the car clearly had it within it. Renault spent a lot of money in this car. They were looking towards the future. They were looking to perhaps the silhouette formula that we may one day see. And this was their sort of prototype adventure in that field. So therefore, the car that I drove certainly was one that gave me pleasure. Much more forgivable than a Grand Prix car, and therefore, in a way, as I said at the beginning, much more enjoyable. Only one Monegasque has won the Monaco Grand Prix. That was Louis Chiron way back in 1931. I've managed to win four times here, once in a Formula 3 car, the other three times in Formula 1. It is the most glamorous place for a driver to race, but the technique of driving hasn't changed very much. All those years ago when I was driving a Formula 1 car, well, I have had the opportunity of driving the new Formula 1 cars. And therefore, it was interesting for me to see what a change it had been. Was it all that different? Not really. Technically, in the world, Great Britain is still the centre of motor racing. And therefore, it should have a capital. The capital of racing is probably a small Midlands town in England called Bicester. It's to Bicester that I went to see the Leighton House March factory and to be fitted for their car. I met up with Ian Phillips, the team manager, and Adrian Newey, the designer of the car. Now, in 1989, the March Judd has not been as competitive as people would have liked it to be. But in 1988, that March 881 was really a competitive motor car. I was able to take the car, after its initial fitting, to Silverstone. And Silverstone, for the British Grand Prix in 1988, had been a big racetrack for even Capelli, who was driving the car in that Grand Prix. The car was very strange. The era of the designer seems to have appeared, because racing drivers themselves, it would seem, have not a lot of say with regards to the cockpit comforts or refinements. My biggest criticism of the march was the incredible lack of space. For the driver, there was no space, because Adrian Newey, the designer, said it had to be that way, because aerodynamically, the car had to be this narrow and this shape. I had to point out to him that it was almost impossible, even for me, and I'm a man of average height, I call it average height, relatively small, to fit into his cockpit. I seemed to get cramp on my foot, and I do remember that Capelli suffered very badly in 1988, by leg cramps and foot cramps. There was no foot rest to speak of for the left foot. There was simply nowhere to put your foot other than on the clutch pedal. And if a racing driver touches a racing clutch at high speed, it only takes a few short laps to burn the clutch out. So really the impracticability of having such a narrow foot well, in my mind, was a folly. 
soon as we start the engine up, you can turn the pump on. <laughs> the team, however, was very efficient. It was extremely good to work with. 60 people worked in the Leighton House March team at that time, against, for example, the 160 that worked for McLaren. Silverstone is almost billiard table smooth, hardly any bumps at all, but the pit lane is bumpy, and the suspension of the march was so firm, so tight, that when you left the pit lane and went over some bumps on the track, your feet bounced off the pedals and bounced off the floor well in such a way that you could hardly control the car. That impressed me in a negative fashion. The car just seemed to be too hard, and again, aerodynamics were making that car run very close to the ground to get maximum performance out of it. I found it also very difficult to drive this car at great speed at Silverstone. It's such a fast corner with so many high speed corners that frankly, when you're new to a car and for me coming back to motor racing, I just never felt that I wanted to take too much out of the car or too much out of me. The penalty for error at Silverstone is too great because hardly any of the corners are slow. So therefore my experience there was to be indoctrinated with the new generation of Grand Prix cars. And certainly this was even amongst the others, perhaps the firmest, perhaps the roughest to drive with regards to harshness. And certainly it would appear to be the smallest. It was fast at that time, but it wasn't comfortable. And I don't really think there are two drivers, Guzelman, who is very fast, and Capelli, also very fast, could have taken the maximum out of that car or driven the car to the ultimate limit of their abilities, simply because it was too uncomfortable and too cramped. <laughs> Nevertheless, they gave me every cooperation the Judd engine performed well, it was a flexible engine, it didn't seem to have an excess of power, but it certainly didn't give me any trouble on pick-up or on lift-off. Ran into some mechanical problems with it, electrical it turned out to be, and I suppose that I was doing some good service to them to have their electrical problems weeded out before the next Grand Prix which they were just about to go over to. So driving the march, to say the least, was uncomfortable, but nevertheless, impressive. Well, it's been a long time since I drove this car. Some days it seems like only yesterday, and some other days it feels like I never did. Today it feels like it was only yesterday that I was racing this car, not on this track, because I never had the opportunity of racing in Donington because I retired with this car, this very car, at the end of 1973. Now, very recently, I've had the opportunity of driving some of the greatest racing cars in the world. One of the more unusual cars I had the privilege of driving was the Peugeot 405 16 Turbo the Grand Red, in English, the Great Raider. And this is one of the cars that did the Paris-Dakar race, one of the great challenges within the motorsporting world of these years. I arrived at the Saragossa airport in the center of Spain in a private jet. I was expecting to meet Ari Vatanen, who had been racing the previous day. Sadly, no Ari Vatanen, no Jackie X, who was also there for the previous day, and no one else who was really expert in showing me the tremendous difference of driving that this 405 Peugeot had over any other car in a terrain that I had never seen or driven on before. So soft was the desert in certain places that a normal car wouldn't even be able to move a few centimeters or inches. I was able to get fitted to the car and it was indeed uh, a special motor car, lightweight, very strong, obviously, high off the ground with tremendous wheel movement to the suspension, many shock absorbers in each corner, and a sophistication of ruggedness that clearly Peugeot have mastered more than perhaps any other manufacturer in that type of racing today. Sadly, I was given a very short time in the car. 
We were going to mount a camera in the car, but I felt as if I needed somebody sitting beside me to tell me where to go and to what to do. I didn't know how to drive a car that had four-wheel drive and maybe four-wheel steer in a set of circumstances that were so foreign to me. We did a gentle lap, we did another gentle lap, and then we went down a long back stretch of straight road. There were several humps and bumps towards the end of this long straight, which was taken in sixth gear. It had a six-speed gearbox, this car. My passenger was an engineer of enormous experience. I didn't know how fast one could go over those humps and bumps. I looked over to him and he seemed to be in order. I thought maybe I should brake, so I brake. Then I thought maybe I should change gear and I changed down into fifth gear and I slowed the car down again on brakes. Not knowing what speed to travel at over the bumps, I thought I had reduced speed sufficiently to handle it but was completely unaware. It seems also my co-pilot, who would normally be navigating, didn't know either, because we entered the first bump. The car suddenly launched itself into the air. It must have gone three meters, I would think, in the air. And suddenly, I found that Peugeot 405s don't fly too well. The car did not fly level. The car suddenly dipped its nose very aggressively and dashed towards the ground. The car caught and rolled over, end over end, turned over and did four more rolls. An impressive accident, to say the least, and one that I felt particularly sorrowful about, because it was one of ignorance, it was one of not being told. Had I had a driver of experience, I would have first gone out with him driving to show me the road for him to show me at what speeds those things could, could be done and could be taken at. He would have shown me the technique of driving, which I was slowly getting to the hang of. But without that, frankly, I was a virgin at the stake. It was the end of not a very nice experience. We were able to roll the car back on to its feet, and the car would certainly have not continued. If it had been in the Paris Dakar, and there are some cars do roll, this one would not have gone any distance. The rear suspension was severely damaged. And frankly, it was the end of not a very nice day for me. The car itself, I'm sure by now, is well repaired and competing successfully again. Because Peugeot surely have shown themselves to be the most aggressive in this formula, and have been all conquering. The talents of Ari Vatanen and Jackie X and all their other drivers clearly are specialists in a field where this type of motoring is rare and where they are able to exercise this remarkable car to its fullest extent. For me, it will only be a memory which, frankly, I would rather forget. came to Monaco, it was 100 laps around this tight little circuit. Very tiring and very demanding for the car as well as the driver. But you know, the most impressive thing to me was when I saw the turbocharged cars driving around here with perhaps a thousand brake horsepower, sometimes in qualifying 1300 horsepower. That was a challenge. And that, from a driver's point of view, was a very difficult thing to do. How do you control that much horsepower? Well. Looking back just a little bit, I had the opportunity of sitting into the Benetton Grand Prix car with the turbocharged engine, with the Ford engine. I drove it at Alton Park in Cheshire in the north of England, but it did give me an impression of all that power. When I drove those great Grand Prix cars, however, of present day, I started off with not a brand new car, because I wanted to feel the power of the turbo era. The 1500cc turbocharged with twin turbo Benetton Ford. I drove this car at Alton Park, and my goodness, wasn't it powerful? An immense amount of power, but ironically, very gentle in its power. You could ease the power in or take the power off without the car being very reactionary. The team were good to work with. I had gone to their factory at Whitney to be sure that I could fit appropriately into the car. My biggest criticism was the cockpit of the car. It wasn't well laid out. It had never clearly had an experienced driver drive it. Many 
The steering wheel was in the wrong place. The gauges could not be read clearly. The gear shift was awkward, and the pedals didn't function as a racing driver of experience would want them to function. If you look back in the history of the Benetton team and before them the Tolman team, who they were to take over, you would know that there were no established Grand Prix drivers, there were no Alan Frost or Nelson Piquets or even Nigel Mansells in those cars. They were young up-and-coming drivers who would have given their right arm to drive a Grand Prix car and would certainly not criticise the team for the position of driving. To drive it on the track, however, the car was progressive. It had slow understeer on slow corners. It seemed to be a very aerodynamic car. Good at high speed, but not so good at low speeds. Warming, not the nice no, what you need to do actually, if he wants to test this now, I mean, before he gets the other one, Nanini, I mean, is put a wedge shaped wooden block on the pedal, on the pedal so yeah. that it brings this bit. You see, when you push that it back, you're face. doing that. Yeah. What he needs is that. Yeah. So if you just got a, a wedge, like a piece of cheese, yeah. on it, that would let him reach the end of the movement. Right. Changing gear, one had to be very gentle that you didn't immediately spin the rear wheels because there was an excess of power. About a thousand brake horsepower if you really tweaked up the turbo. But I certainly think I would have been using around 900 horsepower when I drove it. We broke the lap record at Alton Park. Of course, there hadn't been a competitive Grand Prix car having driven there for many years. It was an old record. But nevertheless, it was quite a thrill to drive it in a very cold and windy February day. It was a thrill to drive. It was nice to feel that much power again. Team well turned out, well prepared and good to work with. The car itself no longer in use because normally aspirated engines have come back to Grand Prix racing but it certainly, for me, was a thrill just to drive that much power. The World Championship of Sports Cars is growing in importance every year. People like Jaguar, Mercedes-Benz, now arriving Peugeot, all of the big names from Japan. It's a very competitive sport, and the FIA are interested in promoting it heavily. Of course, sports cars historically have had a connection with Grand Prix drivers. In my early days, I drove sports cars as well as Grand Prix. So therefore, we had the opportunity to jump from one formula to another. That isn't happening nowadays. Grand Prix drivers tend to be very isolated in their own sport of single-seaters. But the sports car drivers take it very seriously, and the major manufacturers do. Jaguar have won the World Championship of makes. I had the opportunity to drive a Jaguar at the Silverson racetrack, very flat and very fast. In 
my career, I specialized in Grand Prix racing, but in the early years of my racing life, I drove a variety of different racing cars. At the beginning, in fact, one year I drove 26 different racing cars in 53 races. It's pretty difficult to find 26 different racing cars in 12 months. But it did give me an understanding of being able to apply myself to different problems of racing. Because if you drive a touring car, that is very difficult. It's a different type of driving than a single-seater racing car or a big prototype sports car, for example. The Jaguar that I was to drive certainly had a pedigree. This same type of Jaguar had won the 24-hour race of Le Mans. The actual car that I was driving at Silverstone was going to be a sprint Jaguar, the type that went for the 1,000-kilometer races. And when I drove it, it was in a great winning streak, winning the World Championship of sports cars and prototypes. Again, I was amazed and impressed by the space inside the car, because, of course, regulations stipulate that the car has to technically have to accommodate two people, a so-called passenger, although there are precious few who would wish to travel in that fashion. The car was laid out well, and because it is driven for, in some cases, 24 hours, all the modern amenities were there. There was a proper key, there was a starter on it, the mirror was adjustable and very comfortable. They had electric outside mirrors. Pretty tricky for a racing car. But of course, if you think that drivers of different dimensions, perhaps three of them per race, have to jump in and out of the cockpit, clearly the adjustments to outside mirrors have to be easily done and altered as the drivers change, as well as changing the seats for the driver. One of the things I complained about as soon as I got into the car was that the floor well of the car where you put your feet is extremely slippery. I always feel as if the driver should have something that he can hold his heels onto without them slipping around. This was not the case and it's something that I would have wanted to have as a racing driver joining that team. The car also had a peculiarity which I did not like and was later to be embarrassed by. Frankly, the car's head was towards the rear of the car. The car felt not like a mid-engine sports car, but like a rear-engine sports car. The great length and weight of the Jaguars really was based on the engine itself. The wheelbase was very short but the engine extremely long and extremely heavy. This made the car very sort of elephant-like in the rear end. There's not much footage of me driving this car, and it's all my fault, because I made a mistake. I let the car get away from me. Coming out of a relatively slow corner, I was powering the car with about 750 horsepower underneath my seat. And the car began to slide just a little bit in the rear end. Quite normal for a race car and a race driver. The rear tire got onto what they call the rumble slip. That's the curbing at the side of the track. Without any warning at all, the car went from a gentle progressive oversteer to suddenly changing direction and going the way that the front wheels were pointing was in opposite lock. I was trying to correct the slide. Suddenly I was faced with the car rushing across a grass verge and suddenly coming into heavy contact with a bank. To say the least, embarrassing. Because here I had been given this wonderful car by Tom Walkinshaw and Sir John Egan from Jaguars to test and to speak about. This team had immaculately prepared it. They had brought it and done everything they could for me. And here I had really made an error of judgment. I liked the idea of driving the Jaguar. I did drive it. I felt what it was like. But I didn't certainly take the full potential from the car. The car since then, of course, has been greatly changed. The wheelbase has been extended. The engine has been lightened. And I believe the car today would perhaps be much more drivable. Honda will not go down as one of the great 
cars in the history of motorsport. In 1988, this car got little success. It gave great frustration to its drivers, Nelson Piquet and Nakajima. I had the opportunity of driving the car in an old disused airfield in the east of England called Snetterton. Not the most glamorous track in the world, and certainly no billiard table smooth racetrack. Very bumpy it was indeed. The car had certain problems. First of all, let me talk about the easy ones. The car, of course, was extremely powerful. But with a powerful engine, you have to have a suspension and steering geometry that goes with it to allow the driver to drive in a fashion that reaches the ultimate limit of adhesion and performance of the car. With the Lotus, that was not going to be the case. The car's rear end was very nervous, had very little rebound control. The car felt as if the chassis may have been flexing. It certainly didn't give the driver a great deal of good feel and confidence. One impressive factor, of course, was the Honda engine. Enormous power. It had a strange way of applying itself, though. When I drove the Ford turbocharged engine, it was very gentle, very smooth, almost flexible in its characteristics. The Honda, on the other hand, was very abrupt, very instant. Everything that you did seemed to be a jerk and a move. If you put the power on, it cracked on. It didn't come gently on. And when you were going down the main straight and you took the power off, suddenly the engine's overrun had almost an incredible braking effect on the car. The aerodynamics of the car and the characteristics of the engine overrun were again very aggressive. It certainly was a sympathetic engine to chassis relationship. It was something of an angry power unit of an unfriendly chassis. So it really wasn't a nice experience when you consider that Snetterton itself is extremely bumpy. But the greatest problem I had with the car was the driving position. Designers had decided that it had to be small in the cockpit, in the area restricted. Around the steering wheel and the fairing that came up to the driver, it really felt a very claustrophobic experience. And if a serious accident had occurred in a head-on situation, I feel that the cowling would have been much too close to the driver and could have caused further injury, and that was unnecessary in my mind. But worst of all was the position of the steering wheel. The instrument panel was almost unreadable, the steering wheel itself much too close to the instrument panel. And in fact, the master switch and the jack, the rubber jack that connects the microphone inside the helmet to the switch that allows him to speak to his pit on the radio, was so close to the steering wheel that at the very beginning of my run, I think on the third or fourth, la fourth lap, going through a corner called the bomb hole, I actually got my driving glove jammed between the master switch and the radio jack and the wheel itself. I couldn't move the steering wheel one way or the other and in fact I spun the car in the process because I switched the engine off without intent. I had to take my glove off and remove the steering wheel to untangle the mess. Now maybe I was wearing driving gloves that are a little bit heavier than what Nakajima or PK wears. The car, of course, was exciting to drive, but not in a, not in a comfortable way. I felt the car was over nervous, was too highly strong, and really, I suppose the results of the year of 1988 spoke for themselves. It was not a car that Nelson Piquet would have wanted to drive too many more times. So perhaps one of the more disappointing cars that I drove in the whole test.
racing career never involved motorcycles, but many racing drivers started on motorbikes before they got into the four-wheel species. In the United States of America particularly, motorcycle racing has now become extremely important with all the leading riders in the world basically coming from only two countries, Australia and more importantly from the United States. They've bred very good riders but they've bred very good specialized cars also at Indianapolis. And unquestionably, the leader of that particular species is the Penske. Roger Penske, a remarkable man, a racing driver himself, now a very important businessman in the, in the United States, has a racing team that is mightily successful. Penske cars have won quite a few Indianapolises. And I had the opportunity of driving the winning car at Indianapolis at the Mid-Ohio racetrack in the middle of the United States. The next car I was to drive, I had to travel by Concord to New York, a private aircraft to Mid-Ohio, to a wonderful, picturesque little racetrack tucked away in the center of the state of Ohio. And there I had the Indianapolis winning Penske to drive. Very impressive car. The car that Rick Mears was to win the 1988 Indianapolis 500 in. And the contrast from driving a Formula One car of the current era to suddenly stepping in to an Indianapolis car yeah, was giant. First of all, I felt that it, of as if I might have been sitting yeah. in the sitting room of Glen Eagles Hotel. There was all the space in the world round the car. <laughs> the car felt that a man yeah. could sit in it almost yeah. at any weight and still be comfortable and, and be able to drive it. So I found the instruments, however, just a here, little bit difficult to read because of my position They're in the car. They're not up there. No. no, you see, even with that there, even with that, I yeah. cannot see the red card. And I just have to tell you, that whatever you guys say, whatever you guys are telling you... On the, on the top of the... Oh, well, in that right case, you can see it. If, if I'm up here, I can see it. <laughs> Hey, we put them where they like to be. Oh, yeah, sure. No, I, I'm no argument yeah. The other problem was that the racetrack itself was very dirty. There had been a race the previous day, and it had been heavy rain, and they had allowed the public to walk across the track <coughs> and other vehicles to come out of the grass and go nice on the racetrack. The there. So nice. therefore, the conditions were not ideal. Lots of dust, <laughs> and the track was damp. So we had to race on wet weather tires to test the car. Maybe they're going so fast now there is no time. Our drivers don't know what urban onyx is. If for any reason you do run out, you can get the electric pump with that switched out, but you, you don't need to normally. That's part of the dash and ignition's on the wheel. So therefore, when you press the accelerator pedal, there is a great lag, a great delay before the power immediately picks up. So you had to anticipate the exit points way in advance to get maximum power on. The power itself, once it came on, was very smooth and not too difficult to drive. An extremely smooth power plant it was, the Ilmo Chevrolet V8 and very smooth, perhaps one of the smoothest racing engines I have ever driven. Extremely tractable, very flexible. The brakes, the handling of the car were very nice and very gentle. There was more suspension on that car than you would have got in a modern day Grand Prix car. And it would only perhaps suggest to me that the technology at Indianapolis is probably still three to five years behind Grand Prix racing. The turnout of the car, however, was immaculate. In motor racing in America, one man rules and has a tremendous image with regards to presentation and preparation. That man's name is Roger Penske, the name on the car that I was driving. His team were immaculate, the transporter was immaculate, the manner in which they fitted me into the car was very professional. Because so many people drive Penske cars, from small people like Rick Mears, a man of average height like me, to taller men like uh, Danny Sullivan, to heavier men of my vintage like Alan Sr. It means that the car has to be adaptable for a great many people. 
So therefore that great amount of space that the cockpit affords obviously allows various dimensions to sit in. Even the screens that uh, are around the cockpit of the car, they have a selection of. So therefore they were able to, in a matter of 20 minutes, fit me into the car with pedal adjustments, column adjustments, steering wheel adjustments, and fairing adjustments to be absolutely ideal for the job in hand. It was a pity that I wasn't able to drive the car properly on slick tires to get down to what might have been a very competitive lap. But it certainly gave me an idea of what kind of performance that one would expect from a car Indy car. Because more than half of the Indy car series now in the United States of America are on road courses. So the days of the mighty oval are over. Of course, Indianapolis is the one that you have to win. And it was this very car that I was able to drive on that day in Ohio. <laughs>